Okay, this chapter we need to learn about curveballs. And you might think that I'm going to throw a curveball with this bocce ball here. It'd be really hard to throw a curveball with a bocce ball. Uh, so I've got here a bocce ball and a, a large book. You know, we homeschool, so we've got books laying all over the place. And here's a, uh, a book about events that changed the world. Anyway, this is kind of a fun book. There's lots of good pictures in it. Uh, but I, I'm not using it to read, though. Not for this project. I read it to the kids, though. Anyway, here's the bocce ball. Here's the book. Watch how it rolls. It's going to go just like you'd expect it to. Okay? Watch how it goes down the thing. Watch where it goes after it rolls off the book. Okay, so my point is the bocce ball went forward and then did a kind of projectile down to the ground and bounced across the floor, just like we'd expect. But if I take this sheet of paper here and it's rolled up, when it rolls down the book, watch what it does. It didn't go forward, it went back. Why is that? Let me show you again. It rolls backwards. It, it rolls down the thing and then it flies backwards. So let's watch, here we go. It flew backwards to my feet. It didn't go forwards like we would expect it to. That's bizarre. Why doesn't it go forwards like everything else? Well, to understand this, you have to understand how a curveball works, okay? So, uh, let me show you how a curveball works. Uh, there's a pitcher throwing a curveball. How do you throw a curveball? Step one, <clears throat> the thrower gives, the, gives a forward speed and puts a spin on the ball. So it's not just a matter of throwing it forwards, you gotta throw it you gotta give it a twist as you throw it. So you throw it and you twist your hand sideways. And you end up, see how my palm ends up upwards like that, just like in that picture there? That's what's gotta happen. So in order to throw a curveball, you gotta go like that with a flick of your wrist. Now, I'm not a baseball coach or a baseball, I mean, I played some years of baseball, but I, I can't throw a curveball with a baseball. But, that's how you do it. And if we were in lab, a normal lab, I'd have you throw a curveball with a ping pong ball, and we can all do that. So, but we're not doing that right now. Right now we're just gonna understand how does the curveball work, okay? So here's a pitcher, he's about to throw a curveball, he's gonna let it go, he's gonna give it a sideways spin along with its forward speed, okay? So as it leaves his hand, his palm is gonna end up. And what that does is it gives it a forward speed and a sideways spin. Those are the two pieces that are necessary to get it to throw a curveball. Okay, so now here's a picture of what's going on. So as the ball is traveling forward, now notice this viewpoint here. We're looking at it from uh, back over here. Oops, wrong oh, no way, sorry. Right here. We're looking at it as if we were a fly up here looking down on the top of that ball. We're seeing it travel forwards. And we're seeing it spin this way. Okay? So here's the ball spinning this way, counterclockwise, but it's traveling that way. Okay? Now, as it does that, this air is going to travel over the top of the ball and the bottom of the ball. Now, just pause for a second and forget about baseballs for just a minute. Okay? From your perspective, which is traveling faster? When you go to pass a semi truck, he's going the same direction as you, and you pass it, and the semi truck is going 50, and you're going 54, and you pass that semi truck, does it look like it's moving very fast? Not really. It's still going 50 miles an hour, though, right? Okay, but what if? The semi truck was going this way, and you're going this way. You're going 54, and the semi truck's going 50. Does that one look like it's traveling very fast? Yeah, it looks like it's traveling very fast. So, my point here is notice the relative speed on the two sides of the ball here. This ball is spinning like this. The air is going past it. And you're going to get two very different relative speeds. This one is going to be a very high relative speed because 
the ball and the air are traveling in opposite directions. Just like when you went down the highway this way at 54 and the semi truck went this semi truck went this way at 50 miles an hour. Very high difference in speed there. Whereas on the other side, it's going to be a very small difference in speed. Now, <clears throat> right here, you have to pause. Uh, when we're talking about curveballs, don't go down the road of Bernoulli's equation. There's something else that's, that's more important here. Okay? The turbulence throws Bernoulli's equation off. Okay? So, uh, and that's just it turbulence happens and that's important and now we just talked about Reynolds number Reynolds equation and one of the key factors in Reynolds equation is speed the larger the speed the more likely turbulence is to occur and so that's what happens then <clears throat> the Reynolds number on this side is much larger than the Reynolds number on this side so you get turbulence on this side of the ball but not on this side of the ball. And so when you draw that, oh yeah, don't forget Reynolds equation. Speed, the bigger the speed is, the bigger the Reynolds number. Okay? So what happens is you get turbulence on this side, but not on this side. Okay? That's huge. Okay, so now step through this logic here. We're on step four. Step one, baseball pitcher throws the ball forward with a sideways twist. Because of that, because of that, you have two different relative velocities, a high speed here and a low speed here. This logic that I'm showing you here with baseballs, you're going to have to apply it to several different objects, okay? So make sure that you understand this, this logic. Because there's a difference in relative speed, you get Reynolds numbers higher on this side than on this side, which, step forward in logic, shows you you get turbulence on one side, but not the other. Now, here's the catch. Because the turbulence occurs on the right side of the ball, the air doesn't seem to stick there as well as it does on the other side of the ball. So let me just say this again. Laminar airflow sticks to the side of the object. So as this smoothly flowing, air, smoothly flowing air travels over this ball, it sticks to the edge of the ball. This one, however, doesn't. It just kind of goes like that, okay? It sticks to the ball, and that, as the ball continues to rotate, it pulls the air on the left side to the right. Now that's huge. Okay, let me, let me say this again. The air sticks to the ball. As the air sticks to the ball, the ball, because it's spinning, pulls the air in. Where's in? Remember, here's the left side of the ball, here's the right side. Remember, we're looking at this from the top down, from a fly's view, okay? The ball pulls the air to the right. Therefore, what's Newton's third law say? Pulls the, ball, pulls the air to the right, therefore Newton's third law says, if ball pulls air to the right, the air pulls the ball to the left. And that's how the curveball is going to happen. So when the pitcher throws it, it looks like it's going to go to the right of the, of, the, of the strike zone, but then it pulls to the left because of this force. And this force has a name. It's called the Magnus force. And it pulls the ball to the left. Uh, <clears throat> because of this force and the forward speed is that ball is going to end up curving to the left. Now, uh, that's kind of weird, isn't it? That's kind of counterintuitive. People figured this out by accident. They did it a, f a few times, and then they said, oh, I can do that on purpose, and then it became a useful little trick in baseball. But it's not just baseball. You do it in soccer. You do it in croquet. Not croquet. You don't do that in croquet. Uh, cricket. That's the word I was looking for. It's huge in cricket. Uh, so this is, this is a, a major thing.
thing that happens in lots of ball sports. So it ends up curving as a result. Now, this is my drawing. Let me show you real life what this looks like. Here's a picture of it. Look at that. Here's the baseball spinning this way. Okay, I think I've got arrows for this. It's traveling forward, spinning that way. And then you say, well, how is that happening? It's actually, this baseball is in a, uh, 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 an air chamber, a, a, a wind tunnel, and so there's wind going over the ball, so it's as if it's moving forward, and they attach it to a little motor so that it spins at the speed a baseball player would throw it, and then they put these two little straws right here, and then they insert smoke through those straws, and this smoke has um, little phosphorescence in it so that when you shine a black light on it, the smoke glows and you can see easily where the turbulence occurs. So notice the air flows, out, flows over the top and because of the low speed, uh, you don't get much turbulence over here. Now notice there's a little bump here and here. Where did that bump come from? And there's no, no one over there too. Bump, bump. <laughs> I, I suspect it was from bump, bump. The bumps on the baseball. But it doesn't, that's not the important part, that was just a side note. The point is, airflow stays mostly in contact here, and it, the spinning ball pulls the air down over here. But over here, look at this, immediate, right there, swirls, and all the smoke is swirling. The end result, there's a force that pulls it to the side, and it's going to end up curving the ball. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> I hope that helps. Uh, helps you, hope that helps you understand how to throw a curveball, how curveballs work. Um, when you get to cricket, there's actually some other tricks that you can do, uh, but I'm not going to go down that road right now. I'm not a cricket player at all. I'm just it's interesting to study. Uh, but let's talk about golf balls now. Have you ever thought about wh why is it that golf balls have dimples? Why don't they just make them smooth? It seems like it would just it would travel better if it was smooth. Now, this is why one of the reasons why fluid dynamics is so um, it, it's it's the least understood of all the sciences. So when you when you send a golf ball out, it actually it turns out it travels farther with dimples, significantly farther actually. And uh, let me show you this picture that helps you understand this. Um, these aren't golf balls. This is just a ball. And let me explain the picture for you. It's, in, it, it, it's like a, uh, a wind tunnel. It's not wind. It's a water tunnel. Okay, so here's a ball. It's a smooth ball, and it's in water. And the water is flowing over it very rapidly. So it's like the ball is traveling quickly. Okay, so the air, so the water is traveling over it very quickly, and right here you see turbulence forming. And these are actually voids in the water. Um, you've probably done this. Uh, if you just take your hand in the water and you move it real fast, you can see there's this pocket of what looks like air behind your hand. It's not air, it's just a void. It's a, it's a place where the water, it's, uh, the water's inertia is too great to go in and, and fill the gap. And so, the water just stays where it's at and there's a gap that forms behind your hand. And these are those voids forming behind the ball. Other words, in other words, it's turbulence. Okay? So let me show you a different picture now. This picture is the same ball only, and it's in the same fluid flow of water. And the, everything's at the same speed, but the difference is this little front part right here. They painted on some sand made it a little rough there, just at the front. You see that? There's just this, see the difference here, this front area compared to that front area. They put some roughness there. And what that did is it changed drastically where the turbulence flowed, f formed. This has significantly less turbulence than this one. And the only difference is the roughness at the front. Oh, that's pretty interesting. This is something that is not intuitive at all. We, the only reason we know this is because we measure it. <clears throat> so now let's talk about golf balls. Golf balls have dimples in it. And notice what happens. At each dimple, you get micro turbulence. And these 
this microturbulence at the dimples actually causes a little bit of a void that sucks the larger air down and holds it to the golf ball better, just like in that picture that I showed you a minute ago. So the end result is, if you have a smooth golf ball, which they don't make these by the way because everybody realizes this now, if you had a smooth golf ball, you'd have a lot of turbulence. And that turbulence would cause a lot of drag, friction. But if you add dimples everywhere, all those dimples form little micro vacuums that hold the air to the surface better. It gives you laminar airflow longer, which means you get less turbulence, which means less drag, which means less friction, which means it's going to travel farther. And so uh, golf ball dimples intentionally create turbulence to have but micro turbulence, turbulence to help hold the larger airflow to it. So the larger airflow is laminar, even though there's micro turbulence along the way. Uh, and here's a picture of a golf ball in that same uh, um, phosphorescent, phosphorescent um, airflow. There's a lot of turbulence going on behind a golf ball, and and turbulence and how that affects the flight of the ball, the spin of the ball. You can you can definitely put a hook on a on a, uh, on a uh, golf ball. Anybody who golfs knows about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, there we go. We finished the chapter, but I have a few quick questions for you, okay? Uh, first question. A vortex from a vortex cannon rotates which way? Clockwise, counterclockwise, or it doesn't rotate, or from the middle forward and then backwards to the outer edge? Huh. Let's think about that for a second. If it rotates clockwise, what would that be? That would be rotating this way. If it rotates, uh, oh, from the shooter's viewpoint. So the shooter's over here, so the shooter's on this side. Let's see, it's, yeah, it would be this way, okay? And then counterclockwise would be this way, and the answer C is it doesn't rotate at all, and the answer D is it rotates from the middle out. Middle out. Well, if you recall, when we talked about this at the time, because of the walls of the tube on a vortex cannon, it doesn't matter, any tube is the same way, there's friction. And so the air flows slowly on the outer edges, but travels rapidly down the middle. And the end result is, it rotates from the middle forward and then backwards to the outer edge. So the answer here is D. Next one. Why do umbrellas flip up in a gust of wind? And there's a poor lady with a, uh, 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 an umbrella that's been flipped up. Why does that happen? What's going on here? <clears throat> and your options are because of Bernoulli's principle, because of Pascal's principle, because of Poissois' principle, or because of Reynolds' principle. Oh man, all these crazy names. You've got to, yeah, you got to know all those names. What do each one of those people do? Well, let's talk about this here. Here's, uh, here's a person holding an umbrella, and the umbrella goes like this. Okay? And it keeps them dry from the rain. But if a big gust of wind comes, some of the air is going to go straight under the umbrella, and some of the air is going to have to go up and over the umbrella. And when it goes over the umbrella, it's going to travel a greater distance in the same time. Distance over time is speed. That means a high speed on top. And the bottom part is going to travel a smaller distance in the same time. It means a low speed on the bottom. And according to Bernoulli, that gives you a high pressure on the bottom and a low pressure on top. And if this were an airplane, it would get picked up, but it's not. It's an umbrella. So it gets picked up and it flips upside down like you saw in the picture over here. So this is a Bernoulli's principle problem. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> Pascal's principle dealt with how uh, if you increase the pressure one, in one place, it increases everywhere. That's what we, we use Pascal's principle when we're talking about hydraulics. Poissois' principle deals with 
uh, fluid flow and how rapidly it flows through a hose or a pipe. And Reynolds' principle deals with uh, turbulence. Okay, so I hope that helps you keep track of which one deals with what, with which one. Last question. Uh, in order for an airplane to comfortably turn, which control surfaces must be used? Hmm. Elevator, slats, flaps, ailerons, or rudder? Oh no, all these different options. And there's, a, there's a picture of a very large airplane in our Air Force. I think that's a C-147. Uh, which one is it? Well, which ones do what? Okay, what does the elevator do? The elevator points the airplane, pushes the tail down and makes the airplane go up, or pushes the tail up and makes the airplane go down. Okay, elevator makes the airplane go up or down. Slats, what do those do? Well, those come off the front of the wing. At the same time, the flaps go down on the back side of the wing. And the whole point of the, slaps and the, the slats and the flaps is to allow the airplane to go slow and have the pilot still have a chance of seeing the ground beneath them. Otherwise, if you go slow, if you don't have flaps and slats, you got to point the airplane up. And that's hard to see the runway when you're going to, coming in for a landing. Ailerons, what do those do? Well, there's one on this side of the wing and one on this side of the wing, and they do opposite. Remember, so if, the, if I was flying at you and I was an airplane, which would be a lot of fun, actually. I wish I could be, but anyway. So this is my left wing, this is my right wing, and I'm flying out the camera towards you. If I take my left aileron and put it down, that's gonna pick my left wing up. And, I, and at the same time I put my right aileron up, it would push my right wing down. And so I'm gonna tip this way, and that's gonna cause me to turn, okay? And so when I bank the airplane to the side, it's gonna make the airplane turn. Okay, so that ailerons turn the airplane. Hey, that's, that's looking pretty good, okay. What about the rudder? Well, the rudder, remember, uh, uh, the rudder is the one in this horizontal stabilizer here in the back, and when you turn that, that's gonna point the nose to the left or to the right, and that'll turn the airplane. Now, here's the thing with the rudder. If you turn it to the right with the rudder, you will turn the airplane, but here's what's gonna happen. It rotates at about the yaw axis. Yeah, it rotates around the yaw axis and it will rotate sideways. <clears throat> and every passenger in that airplane will yak because their stomach will be off to the side while they're turning to the right. It's not comfortable. If you want a comfortable turn, you've got to bank the airplane over. Humans like it when their bellies are pulled down. We're comfortable with that, we're used to it. When our bellies are pulled to the side, oh, things get fishy. Our equilibrium's thrown off and any food that used to be in the belly doesn't stay there. So, if you bank the airplane, then we're still pulling the belly down. It might pull it down a little extra hard, but it's still going down. Okay? so. Uh, now, the answer here is D, but really if you're a pilot, the answer is primarily D with a little bit of E and a little bit of A. But that's because as you bank the airplane, you lose some lift, so you have to pick, make up for the lift by giving your nose a little bit more with the elevator. But then when you do all that, it makes the airplane uncoordinated, so you got to kick the rudder a little bit to the right and that'll be a coordinated turn and that will be the best turn. But for the answer to the question, the answer is D. Okay? So uh, I hope that helps and we're done with chapter six. Woohoo!